for Shabbat Shalom. For this last uh, Shabbat of the year, uh, I asked myself, what's the most important theme uh, that I could present uh, to the congregation? And the Lord impressed upon me today to speak on the Lordship uh, of Yeshua uh, in our lives uh, and to exhort you in very practical ways uh, to make this an ever-increasing priority and, and commitment for this upcoming year of 2018 and to have your heart flooded with the beauty and the love and the excellency of Yeshua. So let me start with this basic question of, of what is the gospel? Which is in many ways is similar to asking the question, what does it mean to make Yeshua the Lord of your life? And in answer to that, we're going to look at some very practical aspects of the Lordship of Messiah in your life. Uh, so here's the outline. We'll put it on the overhead as well. Uh, number one, uh, why is the Lordship important? Uh, number two, four practical aspects of it. Number three, how it relates to the gospel itself. Uh, and some implications for your life. So again, uh, the, why is the Lordship of Yeshua important? Uh, four aspects of it, how it relates to the gospel, and some practical implications of, for your, how you live your daily life. So number one, why is the Lordship of Yeshua important? You know, today in America, within the intellectual elites, if you will, within the philosophy departments of major universities, uh, the reigning worldview is what they call pragmatism. Pragmatism basically says there is no truth with a capital T. Uh, there's only what's true for me. What works for me. That's what's true. Now, 30, 40 years ago, people who were skeptical about Yeshua faith, Messianic faith, they tended to say, I won't believe the gospel unless you can prove it to me. Uh, prove me that there's a God. Prove me Yeshua rose from the dead. Uh, and as irritating and as arrogant and as misdirected as those kinds of questions were, at least those skeptics 30, 40 years ago were saying, if you could prove it was true, I'll believe it. They still had this idea, maybe Christianity, Messianic Judaism is true, uh, maybe it's not, but if you can prove it to me, I'll believe it. And if you can't, I won't. But that's really not the concern of people today. Today, many people say, I'm not a believer, I'm not a Yeshua follower, because it doesn't work for me. Uh, and even people who, who are seeking, uh, who are often seeking it, they're often seeking it today pragmatically, uh, for what they can get out of it, what, what's in it for me, uh, such as health and wealth, uh, fueled by this watered-down, one-dimensional messages from seeker-friendly congregations uh, and feel-good, uh, prosperity, uh, so-called gospel ministries. Now, what you ultimately have in pragmatism is the idea that says, my personal consciousness is the ultimate determiner of truth. I don't find truth out there somewhere, you know, externally, objectively, uh, outside of myself, and then conform my consciousness to it. No, pragmatism says, I find the truth in here, within me, you know, internally. Uh, I find truth inside, and I only conform to my own personal truth. <clears throat> now, this runs directly up against the lordship claims of Yeshua. Because Yeshua says he is the Lord. For example, in John 14, verse 6, Yeshua says, I am the way and the truth and the life. He says, contrary to finding the, your own truth, Yeshua says, I am the truth. He says, not your likes and dislikes, not your consciousness, to determine what's true and what's not true. I am the truth. And therefore, I determine what's universally true and what's universally not true. Pragmatism uh, directly butts up against uh, the Lordship of Messiah because Yeshua says, I am the truth. Yeshua says stuff like this, uh, Luke 14, 26. If anyone would come after me and does not hate his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brothers and sisters, Yes, even life itself, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, this outrageous sounding statement is the death of pragmatism and the death of our modern, extreme, what they call expressive individualism. Expressive individualism says, I and I alone decide what's true or not true for me. It 
it crowns the self as sovereign. Now, when Yeshua says you have to hate your father and your mother and even hate your own life even to be my disciple, he's not saying you're supposed to be hostile towards your parents uh, or towards yourself. He's not saying that. Uh, when, you, when, you, when he says to, to hate yourself, uh, you have to have, you hate your own life in order to be my disciple, if you read that through our modern, individual, psychologized grid, all your warning bells will go off. Oh my gosh, uh, he's advocating low self-esteem. <laughs> but he's not really saying that at all. He uses the word hate here in typical Hebraic hyperbole uh, as a vivid metaphor to say, the love and regard that you have for me has to be so much beyond the love and regard you have for anyone else, including even your own parents and your own feelings, your own sense sensibility, your own intuition, your own evaluation. The love and regard for me has to be so much above and beyond all of that, beyond your love for any other person, that your love and regard for them looks like hate compared to your love and regard for me. So when Yeshua says you have to hate your own self, or your own life for my sake, he's saying you must be willing to lose everything. You must be willing to follow me even if it's not, quote, working for you. Even if it's not paying off. You have to be, you have to be willing to lose everything for me. Why, you may ask? Well, because he says I lost everything for you. I'm just asking you to be willing to lose everything for me, but I really lost everything for you. So when Yeshua says, I lost everything for you, I am the way and the truth and the life, your consciousness is not the arbiter of reality. He's making an enormous claim that comes right up against American pragmatism. Now here's the problem. Does Yeshua faith work for the believer? Absolutely, Yeshua faith works. In the long run, obeying the truth will work. It'll bring you to glory. Uh, and, and disobeying the truth will not work and will ultimately bring you to ruin. But in the short run, it is true that during this life, obeying the truth might lead to uh, ostracism or persecution or, or tribulation and suffering. You see, the problem with, uh, with asking, will this work for me? Uh, uh, well, that's the wrong question. Did it work for Yeshua, who was crucified? Uh, did it work for Paul, uh, who was whipped and stoned and imprisoned and shipwrecked and ultimately beheaded? Uh, did it work for all the heroes of the faith, the, the martyrs listed in Hebrews 11? You see, asking if our faith works pragmatically is the wrong question. Now, over the years, I've seen a lot of people who sincerely sought the Lord, uh, sincerely gave themselves uh, to Messianic faith, uh, put their faith in Yeshua as the Messiah, uh, were very active in, in some congregation or another for, for several years, and then something came along uh, whereby to identify with Yeshua would cost them. For, for example, uh, it might uh, mean, um, um, it may mean missing out on a new love interest. Uh, it might mean saying no to premarital sex or passing up on a romantic relationship uh, with a non-believer. It might mean having to make a choice between getting into the relationship I've always wanted or being true to my identity and convictions as a Yeshua follower. Or it could mean some major professional setback uh, where there's no way to maintain your integrity as a believer and still do what you need to do uh, to get this great business deal or even to keep your job. And then you have to make a choice. Uh, all sorts of things can happen where your faith is tested. And over the years, I've seen people uh, who were sincere, but when a fork in the road happened, where they really had to choose between identifying with Yeshua, following Yeshua, living for Yeshua, or their own comfort, or prosperity, or happiness, they bailed out of their faith commitment. Uh, and the reason they bailed out is because they were seeking Yeshua only as long as it, quote, worked for them. But as soon as it no longer worked uh, the way they wanted it to work, suddenly their faith was no longer real to them. 
So it seemed like they really hadn't been converted, uh, hadn't really been a true born again from above a follower all along. They had never really been changed and transformed at a deeper worldview level. They had just conveniently assimilated Yeshua into their basically secular worldview as long as it seemed to work for them and not require too much sacrifice or change. Their view of Yeshua was, it's true, Yeshua is true, if it works for me. But the idea of objective truth, a true faith commitment, it just wasn't there. But this lack of, of transforming new covenant, saving relationship, uh, it was masked, uh, it was hidden, as long as their faith commitments were not too severely tested. As long as they weren't called upon to make significant sacrifices, which is often the only time, actually, uh, when, our, when our true beliefs and our true commitments come to the surface, you know, then it was hidden. Uh, so the question becomes, for you today, did you get into Christianity, did you get into Messianic Judaism to get God to serve your needs? Or for you to serve him? Which is it? And sometimes we really don't know until we're tested and we're asked to make a sacrifice or until we suffer a loss or face persecution. It's very hard to know your own heart. It's really hard sometimes to know whether or not you've gotten into Yeshua faith because it currently works for you, or whether you've made Yeshua not only your Savior, but also your Lord, which, of course, he cannot be one without the other, and that's the point. Now, as, well, as we're going to discuss, uh, none of us has made Yeshua the, our Lord all the way down. But that's the issue. So point number one, the Lordship of Messiah is absolutely crucial for our lives, but it's also a major problem for us as well, for people in our culture. An awful lot of people in America uh, come into Yeshua faith, uh, but they really aren't confronted with what it means when Yeshua says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Or when he says in Luke 14, uh, 26, you have to hate your father and your mother, uh, even hate your own life, if you're going to be my disciple. Now, the gospel is centered on God's grace. But if you understand grace at all, it'll take you to lordship. There's no contradiction between the two. So point number two, what is lordship? Uh, you know, on one level, it simply means unconditional obedience. But rather than giving some kind of formal definition, I want to discuss uh, four aspects of lordship. So let's look at four perspectives on lordship. We'll put on the overhead as well. Uh, identity, what I'm going to call identity, uh, priority, unity, and, and mercy. Uh, identity, priority, unity, and mercy. Lordship is when I get a whole new identity. Uh, we'll put some on the overhead as well. Uh, a whole new uh, priority, a whole new community, and live out of a whole new mercy. Now when I say here four perspectives on lordship, uh, a perspective is one way of looking at the whole object, one way of looking at, at, at the whole of it. So I'm not talking about separate parts. Uh, rather, each perspective is one way of looking at the whole picture of lordship. And by looking at it in these different perspectives, we get a better view of its depth uh, and, and, and multi-dimensions uh, and richness. So let's start by looking at the first perspective I'm calling identity. Uh, Yeshua says this, Luke 9, uh, 21. He says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and, and, the, and the Torah teachers, the teachers of the law. He must, and he must be killed and, and the third day raised again to life. Then he says, in light of this, if anyone would come after me and be my disciple, he must do three things. He must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Why? Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. For what good is it if a man gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits his very soul, his self? 
And over in Mark's gospel, uh, he, put, he says like this, Mark 8, 35, Yeshua says, whoever wants to, to find his soul, his, his life, his self, uh, will lose it. But whoever is willing to lose his self for me and for the gospel will find it. Now this reference to self or to soul, that's identity language. And it's pretty wild. Uh, first Yeshua says, you've got to follow me. That's a lordship issue. You've got to follow me. You've got to be my disciple. And then he uses crucifixion language about taking up your cross. Now, you only take up your cross when you're on, your, on the way to be executed. So Yeshua, is, first of all, he's saying, something is going to happen to your identity that is so radical, it's going to be like a rebirth, uh, a death, and then a resurrection. You will only save your life by first losing it. But the second thing he says, which put this in the overhead as well, which is intriguing, he says this, if you build your identity on anything in this world, anything but me, in the end, you'll lose your very self. You'll lose your true self. But if you follow me, you'll gain your true self. Uh, this is an amazing promise. Yeshua is not saying, I'm calling you to construct on your own some brand new identity. Rather, he's saying, I will help you find who you really are. Because until you know me, you don't know who you are. And we see this, by the way, the same theme of, of losing or forgetting who you are uh, and then finding it again. We see this running throughout many fairy tales, uh, for example, because it's a subconscious or an unconscious memory trace of the original promise of the gospel all the way back from the Garden of Eden. So we see the same theme recurring again and again in, in imaginative literature. So, for example, look at the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis, uh, in book four, called the, the Silver Chair, we're introduced to this character, Prince Rillian, who's a prince, but he's got amnesia uh, because he's under a witch's spell, so he doesn't know who he really is. Uh, and in the same way, Yeshua is saying, until you find me, you're under a spell. You've got amnesia. You're, you're wandering around, you've got this vague feeling of deja vu, and you wonder, why do I feel like this? You don't really know who you are until you find me, Yeshua says. Until then, you don't know who you are because you were built for me. You were built for me. But the important thing is that the allegiance, lordship, and identity are all basically the same thing. Uh, because whatever is the number one allegiance and, and the number one lord in your life is your identity. Period. Listen to this quote from an author I like named Becky Pippert from her book called Out of the Salt Shaker. She says this, we'll put it on the overhead. Uh, she, she says, whatever controls us is really our God. For example, the one who seeks power is controlled by power. The one who seeks acceptance is controlled by the ones that he or she seeks to please. We don't control ourselves. We're controlled by whatever is the Lord of our life. But Yeshua's ownership of our life is not a control that manipulates us or, or takes away our dignity. He governs our life by being who he is without compromise and by insisting that we become all who we were meant to be. And this can, and this can only occur through following him, obeying him, and maintaining a living, passionate kinship to him. Now notice that she says, Whatever you most pursue is the Lord of your life. If you mainly pursue acceptance, you're going to be controlled by other people's approval. If you mainly seek power, you're going to be controlled by power. But, but the one thing you've got to realize is you don't control yourself. You are not in control, no matter who you are. If someone says, well, that's not true for me. I'm not after power or acceptance or money. In fact, the most important thing for me is that nobody controls me. Uh, that's, that's, that's what I'm committed to. Well, well if that's you, uh, that means that you've got this, there's this thirst for independence that's controlling you. That's your God. And that's why you can't get married, uh, because you lose some control, uh, some of your freedom and independence. If someone says, I want no one to control me, then that's one of the reasons you don't have many close friends. 
uh, why you're afraid of commitment. Uh, you're controlled by your desire for independence. Everyone makes a God out of something. As Bob Dylan says, famously said, everyone's got to serve someone. Everyone, whether or not you're religious, uh, everyone has a Lord of their life. And your identity is bound up in this, bound up in your ultimate allegiance. And therefore, you're going to have to have a transformation of your identity if you're, going to have to, if, you, if you're going to truly make Yeshua your Lord. If the main thing that makes you happy is the way you look, uh, or romance, uh, or achievement, or your talent, when you become a Yeshua follower, that has to change. Or else he really isn't the Lord of your life. Now, now how do you know who, who, who your lords are? Here's a little test. Uh, this is from Barbara Boyd, who works for the Navigators, and she says this. The difference between, we'll put this in the overhead, uh, the difference between a real follower of Messiah and a generally moral and religious person is the word if. Uh, people who are generally moral and religious, but who ultimately remain in control of their own life, i.e., they give control uh, to other gods, including especially the god of self, they always say, I'll obey God if. For example, if it doesn't offend my modern sensibilities, I'll obey God. If it doesn't cost me my reputation, then I'll obey. If it doesn't jeopardize my possibility of marriage, I'll obey. If it doesn't cost me serious money, I'll obey. In other words, if you say, I would like to obey God, I would like to become a believer, I would like to live a Yeshua-centered life, if when you say that, then Yeshua is not your Lord. If there's any if in your obedience, look at the other side of that if, and that will show you your real identity. If you say, I'll obey God if he'll get me married, then your ultimate hope and significance rests in being married. It does not rest in God. Look at the other side of your if. If there's any conditions on your obedience, that then you've kept your hand of control over your own life. You think you're in control, not God, but you're really being controlled by something else. And that thing that's controlling you is whatever is on the other side of that if. So the first perspective on lordship is you've got to get a whole new identity because Yeshua must be your number one allegiance. Second, you've got to get a whole new priority. Look at Luke uh, 9.58. Uh, Yeshua replied, Foxes and, uh, have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another, another disciple came up to him and said, Lord, first let me go in and bury my father. Uh, but Yeshua said, Follow me. Let the dead bury their own dead. Still another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back, say goodbye to my family. Yeshua replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now here's the main point I want to emphasize from this uh, famous passage, which admittedly contains some very difficult to understand uh, sayings. Lordship doesn't simply mean that your allegiance to Yeshua is the first of all your various commitments. It's not that he, Yeshua must be, simply be more important than your family, or more important than your job or money, uh, but, and of course all that's true, but what this passage is saying is that Yeshua also has to be the most important thing in each and every area. He's not just the most important thing of all your areas in your life. He's got to be the most important thing in every area. See, it's possible to have a very, especially here in, in, in America, to have a very pietistic, privatized idea of lordship. Where you say, putting Yeshua first is really all about my own quiet time. My reading my Bible, praying, going to shul, going to my home group. Uh, these activities are the main things in my life. Uh, I'm not going to let work or sports or hobbies or romance or anything else infringe on that. And that's good. I'm glad. But you've got to get Yeshua not just the number one area of your life amongst all the other areas. You've got to get Yeshua number one in every area. That's a huge part of lordship. And it's not easy to do. So, for example, what is it? ask yourself, what does it mean for Yeshua to be Lord of my work, to be Lord of my relationships, 
to be Lord of my computer, to be Lord of my checkbook? What does it mean for Yeshua to be Lord in every area of your life? Ask yourself, is Yeshua, is the Messiah pleased with how I behave, for example, and perform my job and interact with others at work? Is he pleased with how I'm doing here? Has his love freed me from all the idols in my workplace? Now, we ask that very same question in all these other areas of your life as well. So that's a second perspective on lordship, the, the area of priority. A third perspective I'm calling community. Now, look at Luke 10, the next chapter, Luke 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 70 uh, others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out the workers into his harvest field. Now, why does he send out 70 disciples? Here's what one commentator says. We'll put this on the overhead as well. He says, uh, the number 12 was significant in choosing the apostles. Israel began with 12 brothers. So this number meant that Yeshua was, was um, recreating the people of God among his followers. So in the same way, we'd expect the number 70 also to be significant. According to Genesis 10, this is the number of the nations in the world, in the table of nations before the Tower of Babel. So this number can be understood as prefiguring the mission in the book of Acts to go out into all the world and preach the gospel to all the nations. What this means is when you become a believer, you're, you're, you are saved into a new humanity. Today, however, you know, in our secular culture, we emphasize, as I said before, pragmatism, a radical, self-focused individualism, whereby we say, my needs are the most important. My desires are the most important thing. My fulfillment and my happiness is the most important thing in my life. So this third perspective on lordship is that you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. You now belong to Yeshua but not just to Yeshua. You're not your own also means you belong to the body of Messiah. You belong to your brothers and sisters in the Lord. So look at 1 Corinthians 12, 12, where Paul says this. Uh, just, as one, just as a body, though one, has many parts, uh, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Messiah. For we are all immersed by one spirit, so as to form one body, with the Jews, Gentiles, slaves, free, and we were all given one spirit to drink, even so the body isn't made up of one part, but of many. Paul's saying that when you're born again, when you're regenerated and filled with the Holy Spirit, you're baptized into the greater body of Messiah, uh, into the community of all believers. And what this means is that God never saves us except into a community. You're automatically seen by God as part of his body. And so lordship, another perspective on lordship is that it means accountability. It means accountability to the community and not just accountability to you and God alone. So here's an here's interesting example. This writer, this young female writer, Lauren Winter, wrote this best-selling New York Times best-selling book called Girl Meets God. She's now written a second book on chastity, and there's a chapter in her book that she labels communal sex. <laughs> and this is what she writes, and we'll put it on the overhead. She writes, we live in a world that says, what I do in my bedroom is my business. What I do sexually in the privacy of my bedroom is my business. But that's not really true from almost any perspective. For example, you may incur a sexually transmitted disease, which has billions of dollars of social costs that we're all paying for. Secondly, there's now overwhelming evidence that children that live with an intact family of father and mother are three times more likely to avoid jail, avoid drugs, avoid crime. So if you use sex for your own individual freedom and pleasure versus using sex in a monogamous family context of husband and wife and, and producing and caring for children and creating a community uh, and creating a stable family, which, by the way, is the only place we know of that is good for children to grow up in, and if children don't grow up in that environment, they're far more likely to end up in drugs uh, and in gangs and crime and jail and all sorts of other problems which society pays for 
Now, given all this, she says, it's silly to think, even for a non, from a non-Christian perspective, it's silly to think that what you do in your bedroom doesn't have an effect on all of us. She says, the truth is, it has a tremendous effect on all of us. What you do in your bedroom doesn't just affect you, it affects me too, and I'm paying for it in higher social costs uh, and in a less healthy society. Wow. And then she, then she gives this illustration. We'll put this in the overhead as well. Here's an illustration she gives about the importance of community and how, how we lack it today. She says, Carrie, this girl she knows, self-identifies herself as a Christian. She was two years out of college, living in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in a funky Victorian rambling house with six other Christian women. Uh, her boyfriend lived down the block. Carrie and her boyfriend weren't having sex, but they were doing everything but having sex, including spending the night with each other regularly. None of Carrie's roommates knew for sure that she wasn't having sex. All they knew was that she regularly spent the night at his apartment. But shockingly, none of Carrie's roommates ever asked her a single question about what was going on behind closed doors. No one offered a loving inquiry or a gentle rebuke or even a bleak offer of an ear. They didn't want to intrude or seem nosy, but she says the Bible tells us to be nosy. <laughs> Lovingly, of course, with restoration, not condemnation, being the goal. But the call of biblical covenant community is to transform seemingly private matters into communal matters. But the believing community, sadly, uh, as Carrie's story suggests, uh, brought out, brought into, uh, um, bought, they, they, we, we've bought into, she says, we've bought into today this privatized, radically individualized narrative that our modern secular society tries to tell us. And therefore, we've lost our vision for true biblical community. And we've bought into the lie that we are nothing but atomized, individual, independent, free agents. Now, this happens today even among ourselves, among self-professed Yeshua followers, because often we haven't really been converted deep down at the worldview level. We're still pragmatists and individualists who believe in what I'm calling the sovereign self. I'm in charge of my life. No one tells me what to do. We still believe this baseline, postmodern story that our culture tries to indoctrinate us with. Rather than confessing, I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. I now belong to the Lord. And I also belong to his others who are also part of his body. And especially my local believing covenant community, my local congregation. So let me read you these two quotes and then offer some practical suggestions on how to work out this lordship in your life. Um, First quote is from uh, uh, Barbara Boyd again, uh, from Navigators, and, and she says this. I quoted this before, by the way, but it's worth repeating. And she says, uh, imagine the distance between the Earth and our sun, which is 93 million miles. Imagine it's the thickness of just one sheet of paper. And therefore, the distance between the Earth and the nearest star would be a stack of paper 70 feet high. And the diameter of, our, of our, just our own galaxy, the Milky Way, would be a stack of papers 10 miles high. And our galaxy is only a single speck, one of an infinite number of galaxies in just the part of the universe that we can see. If, the, if, if, if as, as the Bible says, Yeshua holds all of this together with the word of his power, is that the kind of person you ask into your life to be your assistant or your secretary or your consultant? Of course not. If you were to relate to such a person at all, he would either have to be the absolute Lord of your life or he'd be nothing at all. There is no middle ground. Here's a second quote. Uh, Becky Pippard says this. Uh, we'll put it on the overhead as well. Yeshua's ownership of our lives isn't a control that manipulates us or takes away our dignity. He governs all of our lives by being who he is without compromise and by insisting that we become all that we're meant to be. And this can only occur through following him, obeying him, and maintaining a living, 
passionate kinship to him. God created us for himself. If we live with any center other than Yeshua, we're living incompletely. If Yeshua desires to be Lord of our life, is this desire some kind of little fetish of his? Why is it so important to him? Besides the fact that, of course, he deserves it for, for who he is, he also knows he's the only one in the universe who can control us without destroying us. No one will ever love you like Yeshua. The last breath he ever breathed on this planet was for you. Yeshua will meet you wherever you are and will help you. He's not intimidated by your past failures and broken promises or wounds. He'll make sense out of your brokenness, but can only begin by being Lord of your life today. Not next month, but now. Now, if you put these two quotes together and apply this teaching to your life about making Yeshua the Lord of your life, uh, you can do this now in a deeper, more practical way. So memorize, I'm going to encourage you, to memorize the reasons to make Yeshua the Lord of your life. Remind yourself of them regularly. Help them stir you up, to stir your heart more on fire for Him. So we're going to put up various reasons that we're going to summarize here on the overhead. The first reason to make Yeshua Lord of your life is that if He isn't Lord of your life, something else already is. The only alternative to making Yeshua the absolute Lord of your life is by default to lose control of your life to something else. Remind yourself of this regularly. It's not a question of, do I give up my independence so I can give myself more to Yeshua? No. Your, re your independence really isn't there to begin with. You may not see it, but you're serving something, worshiping something, enslaved to something. You are not this independent free agent that you think you are. You're dominated by something. And you're only true, truly free, ironically, to the degree that you are a slave to Messiah. So the first reason to, for you to make Yeshua the Lord of your life is because something else, some other love, is already there. Second reason to make Yeshua Lord of your life is because this, more than anything else, is what you need. In fact, Becky Pepper, Becky Pepper again, I'm putting that on the overhead, she says this, why would he, why is he, commanding you to obey him? Why is he decreeing you to obey him? Why is he demanding and commanding and directing you to obey him? He doesn't need your loyalty. Uh, he doesn't help him uh, in any way. He's already the Lord of the whole universe, whether you acknowledge him or not. So why is he doing it? There's only one possible reason. It cannot be helping him. He gets nothing out of it. He already has everything. He's the Lord. The only possible reason he's commanding you to give unconditional loyalty to him and commitment and obedience is because he loves you and he knows what's best for you and what you need. Why do you command someone who, who's starving to death to eat? Because that's what they need. The second reason to make Yeshua Lord of your life is because you are dying without him. You are dying without his love and his life in your life, because he is your life. Third reason to make Yeshua Lord of your life is because he deserves it. Again, as Barbara Boyd says, if you don't ask, you don't ask somebody like that to be, to, to be in your life as your assistant. That's silly, that's sacrilegious. A fourth reason to make him Lord is that he deserves it because of the greatness of his sacrifice. Again, as Becky Pipper says, his very last breath on this planet was for you. Fifth reason to make him Lord is, again, as Becky Pipper says, because he's the only person, the only thing in your life that can control you without destroying you. He will not manipulate you. He's the only one who will turn you into a truly free being. Now, in light of all this, let me close by asking ourselves uh, four questions. Four questions by which you can look at every area of your life and evaluate for yourself this issue of lordship. Uh, so to make Yeshua Lord of your life is going to mean obeying, submitting, relying, uh, and expecting. And to the degree you're doing all four of these things, to that degree, Yeshua is the Lord of your life. Because that's what it is to comply with God's command and his word unconditionally. 
So here are the four questions. Number one, I'll put this in the overhead. Am I willing to obey God, uh, whatever he says, in every area of my life, no matter what I feel about it? That's the, area, the first area of, of, of obeying. Uh, this might be your career, uh, your leisure time, your money, your relationships, your thought life, uh, your marriage, uh, your not being married, uh, who you date, what you read, what you watch. Am I willing to obey whatever God says in all of these areas, no matter what I feel about it? So ask yourself. Uh, number two, am I willing to accept and submit to whatever comes into my life as part of God's plan? If God is my king, then I must submit to whatever he sends to me. So here's the second question. Am I willing to thank God for whatever happens in, in this area of my life, whether I understand it or not? You know, there's a lot of believers who are okay with that first question of obeying God, but who have all sorts of trouble with this second question of accepting what he sends. But these are both lordship questions. Am I willing to obey whatever he says, whether, whether I like it or not? And secondly, am I willing to thank God for what's happening, even if I have no idea why, why it's happened to me? And that's hard. But it's treating him as king. Otherwise, you're not really treating him as king. Third, third question, relate, again, the overhead. The third question is, 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 relates to relying upon him. If Yeshua is Lord, he's not someone whose commands you simply comply with. Uh, even the Pharisees did that, right? Rather, he should hold the title to your heart so that you gladly and joyfully give him your total allegiance and loyalty and trust and love. An example of failing to rely on Yeshua as the ultimate allegiance uh, and, and the love of your life was when Abraham made Isaac, Yitzhak, into this idol, placed his ultimate allegiance into his son temporarily and set him in the Lord. And so the Lord had to test him and challenge him at this point. So ask yourself, is there anything, any area in my life that I'm relying on more than God for my meaning in life? You're not treating Yeshua as Lord if there's something else that has this functional role as your greatest beauty or your greatest desire or reliance or hope. This is the idolatry question. It's not quite the same as obedience or submission, uh, it's another aspect of reliance. And the fourth and final aspect is expecting. Confidently expecting great things from God. If Yeshua is your Lord, he is the ultimate power and the ultimate resources, then he's not going to call you to do something without supporting you and backing you. An example of failing to expect great things is Moses. You know, when he was called, uh, his sense of incompetence prevented him immediately from embracing God's challenge. So here's the question I ask myself. Are there problems or limitations in my life that I think are too big for God to remove? If so, you're not trusting him as Lord because you're negative and doubtful. You know, John Newton wrote this great little ditty, put it on the overhead. He says, Thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. So what I, what I want to do is I'm going to encourage you to do this, is to take every area of your life and ask yourself these four questions. Am I willing to obey God whatever? Am I willing to thank God for whatever? Number three, is there anything I'm relying on more than God for my meaning in life? And four, are there any limitations that I think are too big for God uh, and I'm negative and I'm defeatist about them? If so, if you answer any of those questions in the, in the negative, then to that extent, you're not treating Yeshua as your Lord and your King. Remember, thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. Elizabeth Elliot tells a story about a beggar who would go out in the streets during the day with a little bowl filled with these little, small little cop copper coins, maybe 20, 30 little copper coins, and he'd shake the bowl uh, and we'd beg on the street. And one day a king comes up riding on his horse and says, please give me your money. And the beggar's dumbfounded, but, but he's the king. And so he reluctantly gives him 
two copper coins. So the king says, thank you very much, and drops into his bowl two diamonds. And suddenly, the beggar says to himself, why didn't I give him everything? And Elizabeth Elliot says, that's exactly who we are. Yeshua says to us, give me everything. And we reluctantly give him a small portion of our life. My holy brothers and sisters, why don't you today give him everything? Amen? Amen. Let's stand and pray. I want the music team to come on up. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you today as we take stock of this past year of 2017 and we prepare to enter into the new year, 2018. And as we do this, Lord, we most of all thank you for sending us your son, Yeshua. And we confess you, Yeshua, as our Redeemer and our Messiah and our King of Kings and our Bridegroom God and our Lord of Lords. Help us this coming year, Lord, to make you, Yeshua, more and more our Lord in practical, life-changing ways. Not for what I can get out of it, but simply to serve and to honor and to worship and obey you. Help me, Yeshua, daily lay down my life for you. Whether I think my outward circumstances are, quote, working for me or not, because you gave up everything for me. So, Lord, I ask you to change me deep down uh, at the worldview level, or where I love and I serve you, whether it's, quote, working for me or not. Help me to lose my life for your sake so that I may truly gain true life. Help me to find my true identity in you. I give the ownership of my life over to you. Help me put no conditions on following you and obeying you. No conditions, regardless of the costs of my reputation or my relationships or my finances. No conditions. Lord, help me have unconditional surrender to you. Help me to see that I have been bought with a price, that I'm not my own. I'm yours, Yeshua. I also belong to the body of Messiah, your body. Uh, and so I'm accountable to them. Lord, I repent today of buying into the lie of the sovereign self, where I'm accountable to no one else. And I'm just do my own thing. Because your last breath on earth was for me, Yeshua. Let my every breath be for you. For I pray this all in your name, B'Shem Yeshua. Amen.